could say that this is somewhat part two of the from the message this morning as we were called to gather to Christ. And now that we are in Christ, we have a great, wonderful verdict that has been proclaimed by God over us, as we'll see in this portion this evening. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on it. Oh, Father, we do thank you for this word, this wonderful truth that you declared that, that we are now under no condemnation. Oh, Father, we pray that as we study, as we enter into the survey of this chapter and begin with this wonderful, wonderful declaration, we pray that we will give you all the praise and all the glory. For it is all of you and from you and through you and for you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together like this. We pray that the Spirit of God would take this word and apply it to hearts and lives. That not one of us, not one person will leave this place tonight without having heard and having received the wonderful word of life. We give you all the praise and glory in the name of your precious Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. J. Oswald Saunders, he, Sanders, he told a story about Paul Morphy. Now, Morphy was the world's champion chess player in the 1800s. He had been invited by a friend to look at a valuable painting. It was entitled The Chess Player. And in the painting, Satan was represented as playing chess with a young man, and the stake being the young man's soul. The game had reached the stage where it was the young man's move, but he was checkmated. There was no move he could make which would not mean defeat for him. And so the strong feature of this picture was the look on the young man's face, which was of utter despair. It was an utter despair on his face because at that point he realized that his soul was lost. Morphy, who knew more about chess than the artist, he studied the picture for a time, and then he called for a chessboard and pieces to be brought, placing them exactly in the same position as they were in the painting. He said, I'll take the young man's place, and I'll make the move. And then he made the move, which would have set the young man free. Here in Romans, we read, in verse 1, Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There are many who, like the chess player in the picture, are lost. They're under condemnation. Though one of the great problems is that, you might even call it the great tragedy, is that many do not recognize their state. Many don't care about their state, that they are under condemnation. Some who feel that small bit of conviction either try to ignore their precarious position, while others try to make excuses for them, even some just kind of laughing it off as a bad joke. Just before the death of actor W.C. Fields, a friend visited uh, Fields in his hospital room and was surprised when he found him thumbing through a Bible. And so he asked what he was doing with the Bible. And Fields, he replied, I'm looking for loopholes. Well, there are no, lo no loopholes when it comes to the judgment of God against the sinner 
even when it comes to salvation for us, it is not because of any loopholes. It is also not because Jesus was better at playing chess than Satan. To appreciate the verdict that we've received described here in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it would do us good to learn what it means, first of all, to be condemned and to see how desperate one is under condemnation. There is, therefore, now no condemnation. So the implication of this pronouncement by Paul is that he and, and we were once in a state of condemnation. A person who we might call a, some might even call them hyper-Calvinist, you know, they might resist the claim uh, that they were or they might claim, not resist it, but they might claim that they were saved in Christ even before the world began and so that they were never under condemnation. But they, what they fail to understand is true doctrine that testifies that we all were born, we were all conceived in sin and in a condition under condemnation. As a psalmist who is one of God's elect confessed, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And the, Paul, the Apostle Paul here answers that question in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning at verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2, he says, And you, has he quickened or made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the loss of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Note that. We were by nature the children of wrath. Now, since I mentioned hyper-Calvinists, I need to give free uh, billing or fair billing, so I'm going to quote John Calvin, who would not have agreed with hyper-Calvinists. He himself stated, therefore all of us who have descended from impure seed are born infected with the contagion of sin. In fact, before we saw the light of this life, we were soiled and spotted in God's sight. Though God has decreed salvation for the elect, he foreknew before the foundation of the world, the sinner, while in that state of unbelief, is by nature, a child of wrath, meaning under condemnation. He is by, and she is by nature a child of wrath as others. To believe otherwise is to, I believe, give a false hope to many who think themselves that they're good enough for God. Dear people, there are no loopholes. And one a loophole that many try to find is some inner goodness within themselves that would make them, because of that inner goodness, accepted. But if you're not born again, if you're not saved, the question for you is not, are you elect to salvation, but are you still under condemnation? This very night, that question must be answered. Are you under condemnation? The Greek word for condemnation, which is katakrima, means the sentence of damnation or a sentence to damnation. This word is used only three times in the Bible and only in the epistle of Paul to the Romans. We'll read it in Romans 5, verse 16 and 18 in just a moment. And here in Romans 8, verse 1. Though other variations of the word are found throughout the Bible, throughout the scriptures, such as condemn, 
and judgment and wrath, used extensively by Jesus and the other apostles. Condemnation is the form of the legal term. When it's discovered, say, that a crime has been committed, that the law has been broken, there is that process of investigating, which then will lead to these formal charges being levied against that person. And then the process of litigation and leads to to where you're in that court session and then comes at the end of all of that this verdict will that person be acquitted or will they stand guilty and receive the just punishment and the verdict indicates that the defendant then is either free to go because they have been found innocent or the verdict is guilty, condemned. Paul had already dealt with the legal status for all humans, all that are born into this world in Romans 5.18. It says there, Therefore, as by the offense one of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. And so what, it, what he's showing us there, teaching us is that the verdict was made when Adam fell in the transgression, the verdict for everyone who had come after Adam declared condemned. Offense by one, as we all also saw, that also led to death. That through Adam's offense, the judgment of God was pronounced and it was condemnation. Now, this pronouncement not only was pronounced upon Adam. They said, all his seed after him. And so that includes every single one that is in this building. That's a pronouncement that was made upon us and upon all who would be born into this world. And so the pronouncement of condemnation has been declared by God. He's the judge of all. The verdict was made at the fall through Adam. And it's not something that will come only at the end of the world. There will be the consequence of that verdict where there will be those who the Lord will say, Be gone, I never knew you. The judgment seat will be where the penalty is given. Before that day at this present time, apart from Christ though, a person alive in this world already has that verdict made. It's a verdict of condemnation and it's over them. Jesus spoke of this in John chapter 3, verse 18, where he says, He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He that believes not is already under condemnation. It's not just something that will come later. Jesus does not say he that believes not will be condemned at the last day, but he says they're already condemned. If a person is not saved, they're living every single day and every single moment with that condemnation hanging over their head. They may live as though they're free. They may, may enjoy the sunshine. They may be laughing and playing with family and friends, yet they are right now under that Declaration of condemned. The verdict has been made. They are condemned already. And it is this present condemnation, this verdict of guilt, that leads to that then leads to that final and everlasting penalty. And just so we see this penalty for ourselves, turn to Revelation 20. Revelation chapter 20. Just go down to verse 11, if you would, with me. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, 
and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book, or books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now this is a very sobering picture given by Christ Jesus to John on Patmos. He uses some very deliberate imagery here to the apostle, to the apostle John, and to the church, making clear that the condemnation that the world is under is not something just to be taken lightly. The verdict of condemnation leads to uh, this verdict, which leads then to the, the consequence, which is the affliction of that verdict. It's described here in such a way to just show that it is not a place of peace and joy, but suffering. It's described as a lake of fire. Now, the eternal condemnation of Satan and the kingdom of darkness is described in the previous verses. You can read of that judgment that's afflicted upon Satan and the system of the Antichrist in verse 10. And, and note that Satan, he doesn't stand before the throne of God with, with, the, with humans, with those who are the seed of Adam, Adam's race. But he, and the kingdom that he rules over, all the fallen angels, they're, they're cast immediately without question into the lake of fire forever. The Bible says that that's what hell was created for in the first place. And then in verse 11 to the end of the chapter, we have this description of the final judgment upon the nations of the world. And they are judged by one who is completely holy, which is what the throne being white represents. The holiness, the, 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 the might and the... the the purity and the truthfulness and the righteousness of our God so that there is no one, when they stand before God, they can never question. There is no question that the judgment of the holy God against a condemned, wicked people, there's no question that it is just and right. It also says in Acts 17, verse 31, He has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. That is, the Lord Jesus will be that judge on that day. Now down in some parts of the USA, they still have uh, the death penalty on the books. In their law, almost everyone who has that verdict, and it's the verdict of condemnation because of guilt, pronounced on them, they're placed on what they call death row. And while they're on death row, some of them live there condemned for years, waiting for the day to arrive in which they will be executed. And then the day comes, and that person who is living under that condemnation receives that punishment of death. And with the condemned in the world today, they live, as it were, on death row. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. People are living every single day in that death, under that condemnation. They live often maybe for 80 or 90 or 100 years, but then they're called to stand before the Lord. Hebrews 9.27, it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment. And it's at that judgment then that the eternal consequences are declared eternal. Those who are condemned, he says, be gone. I never knew you. As Jesus said concerning hell, again reminding us of the how, how, how it's a sobering truth that we must, we must never neglect to make known that hell is a place of weeping, it's a place of wailing, a place of gnashing of teeth. It says in, it's a place where the fire never is extinguished, never goes out. And where there is blackness, darkness, 
showing that it, it is something that we really can't comprehend, eternal fire and eternal darkness, putting those together. It also says that what Jesus actually said, King James, he says, uh, their worm never dies. And that word worm isn't talking about a, a worm. It, it's a word that was used for the conscience, the knowledge of their sin, their sin before holy God. And so when it says their, wor their, their worm will never die, it means the conscience of their sin before a holy God will never be silenced. People today, they live their lives ignoring the consequence of sin, ignoring the conviction of sin, pushing it away, but in hell they will never be able to do that. It will always be ringing in their ears that they are a sinner without any, any form of redemption but in eternal condemnation. And so it's something never to be spoken of as though it is just a light thing. It is a condemnation of eternal death and eternal suffering, eternal consequences beyond human understanding. To even start to learn of this should give us compassion for the lost, for those who are still lost in this world. I remember one minister saying that when a person preaches on this subject, it should be one where there it is fire mixed with tears because of that. There are hundreds, if not thousands, even right this moment, entering into that part of condemnation this very night. As Jesus said in Matthew 7:13, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Many go there. Many are on that road that leads to destruction. As we consider that as the meaning of condemnation and what the consequence of that condemnation is, we come back now and we consider what Paul is writing here. When he again we read, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we need to understand the, the opposite of what we have in Christ to really, really understand how precious this truth is. To understand that once we were under condemnation, but now we are therefore no longer under condemnation. The word now is present tense. That means right now. If you're saved, if you're born again, right now, you can rejoice in this proclamation. That once you were worthy and I was worthy of that eternal hell that eternal fire and eternal separation from God forever with that ongoing conscience of knowing that I'm a sinner with no way to be saved. We were worthy of that. It's not because of anything good within us that made us to be able to say this and believe this. It's by the grace of God. The right now, this very moment, the person who is, as it says, those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have been born again, saved by grace, who have faith in Christ alone, they are now and forever declared not guilty, no longer under condemnation. If it's applied to you now, it will be applied to you a moment from now, and it will be applied to you forever. It never changes. I remember... That's the cartoon of, of, um, of Charlie Brown. And one of his little friends always had the, the dirt going off him, you know, no matter where he went. It was dusty and dirty, and it was always all over him. And I remember one little comic with him in it, and he actually had a, a shower or a bath, and he looked all clean and... He 
He was one who looked very different, and his hair was combed. And, but as soon as he stepped outside, all of a sudden, all the dust was there again, ink pen. But you know, for us as Christians, that condemnation never comes again as soon as we walk out the door. This is a present and eternal truth. Just like those, remember in the houses at the time when the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt and they were awaiting the Lord to lead them out of that slavery. And so that night they were to put blood over the doors and on the doorposts. And they were to remain inside as the angel of death passed over Egypt and passed over their homes while entering into those homes without the blood, bringing about the death of the firstborn in each family. And just like those in the houses with the blood over the doors and, and on the doorposts, as they were kept safe from death that night, so those who are in Christ Jesus, who shed his blood, who, whose blood flowed down the posts of the cross, are saved and kept saved, kept safe and secure, no longer under condemnation, no longer under that sentence of death. We're safe and secure in Christ Jesus. As Jesus took our place, he became the condemned on the cross so that we would not be condemned. He was inflicted with the, the punishment. And just think again what our punishment would have been without him. It would have been that eternal hell. And he took that eternal punishment on himself for each of us. And he became the condemned he was one who was crucified as the transgressor in our place that we might not be inflicted with that punishment. Just look back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commands his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Basically what Paul is saying here is that there was no one righteous, so nobody would die for a righteous man. Nobody would die for a good man. Because there's no righteous or no good men, no good people. But God, in Christ Jesus, he died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet condemned sinners. In chapter 5, verse 18 again, it says, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. You recall as we studied back in Romans 7, Paul wrote concerning the struggle that he had, the struggle with sin within, even though he was saved. Even though he was in Christ and Christ was in him, he then, as he's describing this struggle, he acknowledges this wretchedness. He cries out, where does my help come from? And in the last verse of chapter 7, he names his, his help. And his help is the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that help, he comes now in chapter 8 and he says, because of his help, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, he does no longer need to fear condemnation. Even in the struggle. Even though there are many things in him and in us that are deserving of condemnation, we all fall short. Yet in Christ, the words now, no condemnation, means that this struggle with sin and that struggle with the old nature 
does not bring that condemnation back on us. John Newton, who in his early years rebelled, he lived a life of uh, ungodliness, and just moments before his passing from this life into glory to be with the Savior, he was heard to say, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. That is the testimony of us all. Great sinners, but Christ is the great Savior. And John Newton, adding to that, he never forgot how great this was. And he owed all of his life, his being saved, his redemption, his being no longer under condemnation to the Lord's mercy through Jesus Christ. And he had them right upon his tombstone. It's also on another commemorative uh, tablet on a, on a church wall. And this is what it says. Once an infidel in liberty, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, and pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. And Charles Wesley said it well. Very much similar truth as, as was said by John Newton, but it's in that great hymn of the faith where he says, And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. That's a glorious verdict. That's a glorious, wonderful, and eternal verdict. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What a joy this should bring to our hearts. What freedom... We've received this all because of the grace of God. We've received it in and through the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, the condemned and worthy of that condemnation, are now declared justified and cleansed, saved, redeemed, reconciled to God, free from that eternal condemnation and free forever. We are set free, but brothers and sisters, we're not set free to go back into the pig pen. We're set free to follow Christ. We're set free to walk in newness of life. We're set free to no longer walk the life of the condemned, but now to walk the life of the sinner that's been released from captivity. To walk, as it says in chapter 8, verse 1, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What this means is that as we have been pardoned, sinners pardoned, we are now called to follow, and we are also given the life and strength to follow God, to follow Christ, to be like Christ, to walk in the newness of life, to let our light shine before men. They say that a person who spends time in prison, they say that they have a greater chance of committing another crime than a person who has never gone to prison. And the reason, you know, that may be varied, but for the person in Christ, we are set free not to reoffend. Rather, we are set free to walk in newness of life. We're set free to live for Christ, to live by the power of Christ. Under condemnation, 
now no longer under condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Spirit applies the Word of God, sanctifies us, empowers us, seals us until the day of redemption. If you go down to verse 5 of, of this chapter, it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now the word carnal in verse 6, it's the same word translated flesh in verse 5 and verse 8. So the flesh or carnal, it's, it's that, that old sinfulness, that sinful nature and there is also that aspect of it being dead, dead to God. The Greek word for mind, what you put your mind to, is a word which Paul uses, the bent of one's mind, one's inclination. He spoke a bit about it in chapter 7 where the, the old nature, its inclination is towards sin. It's in opposition to God. It goes contrary to God. In fact, we see here that it is something so dreadful that in verse 8 he says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And so the, the flesh or the carnal mind is marked with three things. There's hostility toward God. There's a revolting against God, which is the hostility in action. And then there is the inability to be subject to God because it's under the, the old flesh. It's under sin. It's subject not to God. The carnal or fleshly mind is not bent toward or inclined to God in his word. It's not inclined toward what is, what is of the spirit of God. It's, it's in the opposite direction. It's inclined to do those things that are uh, of the world and of the flesh and of, 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 of the lusts of the flesh. Those desires which are, are sinful. It sets its mind on those things. And this emphasizes for us, brothers and sisters, once more the amazing grace of God who declares those who are like that, which we all were, he declares us now no longer condemned. And he calls us who once were in total opposition to him and could not even in the flesh please him in any way. He now enables us by the Spirit to live a life that is pleasing to him. Who walk not after the Spirit, or who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so... This then is, emphasizes that wonderful grace of God and the power of God who made us alive and pardons us from our sin and sets us free to live and live for him, free from the mastery of sin. John 5.24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has ev everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. In the San Diego Superior Court, I read a story of two men. They were on trial for armed robbery. And an eyewitness was called to the stand. And the prosecutor began to question this witness. So speaking to the witness, he said, So you say you were at the scene when the robbery took place. Yes said the witness. And you saw a vehicle leave at the high rate of speed. Yes, said the witness. 
And did you observe the occupants? Oh, yes, yes, two men. And then the prosecutor boomed out loud, Are those two men present in court today? And at that point, everybody noticed the two men lift up their hands. They sealed their fate. They raised their hands. So that was an easy call for the judge pronounced sentence on those two men. They were guilty and they proved it. They couldn't hide the fact. They proved that they were worthy of being condemned to receive their punishment. Well, so with us, as we sat in the Supreme Court of Heaven, the witness that stood with Satan and also our own hearts, and when the pronouncement was made of what we were, our hearts actually condemned us. Our hearts were like those two men that said, yes, we're guilty. The Bible says no one is without excuse. We were guilty. We could not hide the fact from the judge. The judge pronounced that judgment condemned. Condemned, that's the verdict. But praise the Lord, unlike those two guilty men who raised their hands in that San Diego Superior Court, when the time came for our condemnation to be administered, two hands were held up. And those hands were the hands of Jesus. And they took those two hands and they nailed those two hands to the cross. And he took the sentence of death on that cross for us. Therefore, in him we are no longer condemned. And nothing and no one can ever condemn us now and forever. Do you have this hope? Do you have the peace that passes all understanding because you are no longer under condemnation? If you are, I pray that your heart is just filled with joy and thanksgiving to the Lord and that even in the morning when you get up and it's all foggy and dreary and rainy, that rather than dwelling upon how gray it is, you dwell upon the great grace and mercy of the Savior who lifted up his hands for you and for me. For those like Paul who have been saved, we rest in the wonderful truth presented in that one phrase. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful declaration. What a marvelous release from sin. What a glorious Savior. Let's look to him. Be set free to walk according to the Spirit of God. And as you go about your earthly activities and your earthly businesses, don't forget your heavenly pardon. Don't forget what you were. Don't forget what you deserved and what you've been given through and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank the Lord with every breath that you have in you. It's by his wonderful grace. Rejoice in him. Praise the Lord.